There's a lot of cool stuff right now playing on the radio. Or maybe on a streaming platform or something, I don't know. I don't know what's around the corner, but one thing I can say is, yeah, but who did it first? Hello, and welcome to another episode of Yeah, But Who Did It First? A program where we examine current popular music trends and discover their origins. Today, we're getting Bach to basics, and we're going to be looking at the foundation of jazz. Jazz is the great American music that has its root in 1920s New Orleans. It's a combination of blues, African drumming rhythms, uh, think of the syncopations, uh, literally brought over on the slave ships and from the slave work songs, and then also combined with the instruments available at the time. Uh, A traditional New Orleans jazz band would include the front line, so a trumpet, a clarinet, and either a trombone or a tuba, and then a banjo or guitar, or if they were stationary, probably a piano, and definitely bass and drums, the rhythm section. Now, many Americans are sort of ambivalent towards jazz. Uh, Some love it, some hate it, but a lot of people think it's just a type of music that shows up in elevators and around the holidays, and they take for granted how important it is and the impact it had on the rest of the world. Um... Amongst musicians, the term jazz typically elicits one of two responses. Those of us who play jazz, and then those of us who are maybe more classically based. And it's a bit strange because so many jazz players are phenomenal musicians, borderline virtuosos. So why do classical musicians shy away from this art form? In this episode, we're going to take a look at jazz and its origins to find out why there's a divide, and if there should be a divide, between classical and jazz musicians. So, we'll start with the classical musicians. What do they think? Well, most classical musicians cringe when they hear jazz. Um, Basically, what's happening, I think, is that they hear jazz, they hear the actual music, and they don't understand the language of the music. And quite frankly, they get confused, and ergo... They're not pleased. I mean, just play the right notes, right? But it's a bit weird to to think that way because for many people, their happiest moments actually involve jazz. Now, you may or may not celebrate Christmas. That doesn't really matter. But at the holiday season, everyone's in a good mood and the soundtrack of our lives becomes flooded with jazz music. And one of the big things that helped was the Peanuts Christmas special from 1965. Um, It fully cements jazz into the Christmas music ethos, and on top of it, it gives us many non-Christmas jazz tunes as well. And all of these tunes, who are so famous around the world, were written by Vince Guaraldi. Vince was born in California, and he served time in the U.S. Army in the Korean War before coming back to the States and becoming the famous jazz pianist and composer that we know now. When he came back from the war, he began making records right away in 1953, but he didn't get famous until 1963. He wrote a song called Cast Your Fate to the Wind, and it was on the B-side of a single from um, sort of like an opera called Black Orpheus. Black Orpheus was not terribly popular, but when DJs flipped the record over to the B-side, Cast Your Fate into the Wind, everyone loved it. It actually won a Grammy Award for the Best Original Jazz Composition in 1963, and even though he was famous, he wasn't, like, super famous. But two years later, the producer, Lee Mendelson, for the Peanuts Christmas special, heard the song on the radio and got in contact with the radio and then the agent and then Vince Corelli himself and said, hey, would you mind scoring our upcoming Peanuts cartoon? And of course, the rest is history. Now, he was more than just a Peanuts composer. He was a jazz musician in his own right. He formed quintets and trios, often with a vibraphone, and was a studio musician. He was from San Francisco and very well loved in the San Francisco area. And in fact, he was selected to compose a traditional Eucharist church service, um, sort of a, a church service that Bach would have written way back in the day. But they asked him to do it in his own style. So he took this very sacred and very old religious concept and added jazz and bossa nova, sort of like a new age Bach. His influences that led to that were all the jazz that happened before him, sort of the the bop and the New Orleans, uh, blues, boogie-woogie piano players, and he combined it all into this great mixture that was eventually called the Giraldi style. But 
there were other musicians, also well known for combining genres. And the big guy is Miles Davis. He sort of wrote the book on this. Uh, so many nicknames were given to him, the Prince of Darkness, uh, the Picasso of Jazz. He was born in Alton, Illinois and grew up in East St. Louis and was inundated, submersed in jazz from an early age. He loved Charlie Parker and worked hard at the, at the trumpet, even though Charlie Parker played saxophone, and earned enough money to go study at the Juilliard School with Charlie Parker. And Miles Davis sort of was an apprentice to Parker and eventually became the master. He went on to form numerous groups and constantly reinvented the jazz genre. So he worked with Yardbird Parker, and then he went on to inspire John Coltrane, Paul Chambers, Bill Evans, and so many other people that eventually the people that Miles Davis was taking under his wing would go off and start their own bands that would be really famous. Over his career, Miles Davis led the transition from the complex bebop music from the 1940s into modal jazz, to funky jazz, to electric jazz, and to numerous crossover things that happened. He did cover songs. He did Cindy Lauper tune time after time. He did, uh, he did a Michael Jackson song. And all of this combining together helped to create fusion. So he actually wound up inspiring all of the people that came after him. The Picasso of jazz was known for his bop and his bebop in his early days, and then eventually it shifted a little to hard bop and then modal jazz. He actually dabbled a little bit in classical, uh, doing a piece of music called The Maids of Cadiz. Also, he worked in a little bit of opera. Porgy and Bess is an opera by George Gershwin, and Miles Davis made his own arrangement of it. And he had a hard time performing it because the classical musicians couldn't handle the jazz improvisational aspect of it, and the jazz musicians couldn't handle the hard arrangement from the classical side of things. So Miles Davis was able to sort of bridge that gap and then invent his own gaps. He invented a thing called Time No Changes, which basically was just him and his band performing songs continuously without stopping in between the songs. And the only thing that you would know to understand that the song was different was that the melody would change and then the band would adjust accordingly. In the 80s, he started doing electric music and pop rock, like I said, Cyndi Lauper, Michael Jackson. Uh, in the late 60s, he was actually contemplating working with Jimi Hendrix and his band of gypsies. But shortly before they were able to collaborate, Jimi Hendrix passed away. And so that amazing collaboration never happened. But Miles Davis also worked in funk. He also worked in rhythm and blues. He dabbled in soul. And he worked with electronica and electronic drum beats and things that were happening with electronic keyboards and synthesizers in the 1980s. He truly did everything. But what he was most known for was Kind of Blue. It is his epic masterpiece. It is the best-selling jazz album of all time. And in 2009, on the 50th anniversary of its release, the United States Congress actually voted 409 to zero, a unanimous decision to make it a national treasure. It was released in 1959, and it was sort of in reaction to the complex chord changes and the fast music and the virtuosic playing of bebop. He wanted to do something else. So the music on Kind of Blue contains long, beautiful melodies, but not based on scales like we would have, or well, traditional scales that we have in most classical music. He worked with modes, much like the Gregorian monks would have used back in the 11th century. This album was made Oddly enough, despite Miles Davis playing trumpet and having all these brilliant, wonderful, forward-thinking ideas, he was actually thinking of a piano, and specifically a jazz pianist named Bill Evans when he made Kind of Blue. Bill Evans graduated college from Southern Louisiana University with a music teaching degree, but then he joined the U.S. Army and he wound up playing flute in the band with the Army. When he came back, he sort of did the same thing Vince Guaraldi did. He returned to the piano and started making jazz records. Bill Evans' first record was 1956, and like Miles Davis, was working with more melodic music than the music that people were hearing in Bach. The harmonies from Bill Evans were taken from a, a style of classical music in the late Romantic era called Impressionism. And this sort of classical influence was much different than the jazz harmonies that were going on before it. Um, and that is very easily heard in a tune called Blue and Green that was actually written by Bill Evans that was featured on Miles Davis's album, Kind of Blue. Bill Evans was a classically trained pianist at heart, 
a traditional university teaching degree. And his biggest inspirations were German composer J.S. Bach, and he wrote many jazz arrangements of Bach's music. And also French composers Maurice Ravel and Claude Debussy, who were the masters of the Impressionism. Claude Debussy, now we're getting back around World War I, so a good deal ahead of Bill Evans. Uh, the French composer was inspired by the same passions and influences that most other French artists were into in the late 1800s, and like I said, that was Impressionism. So like the paintings by Claude Monet, Claude Debussy's music was blurred. It wasn't very clear. The line between distinctly major and distinctly minor music was crossed. The way Debussy did this was he would make chords that contained multiple notes beyond the three notes that were normally expected in the chord. Or he would think of new ways of organizing notes. Or in other words, like Miles Davis does later, Claude Debussy starts using different types of scales. The reason he started thinking of this was because Debussy was interested in many styles and many types of music, and he literally traveled the world to go listen to these exotic music. Remember, this is the 1800s, so in order to get anywhere, it took a long time, it was very difficult, so everything was exotic. Debussy was among the first people to actually go and make recordings, so he would take wax discs, which eventually would become records, but way back in the late 1800s, they were made out of wax. So he would travel to India, he would travel to China, he would travel to Africa and record this traditional foreign music. And it's not easy to record in the heat of the Sahara Desert with wax discs. So Debussy was taking these things, keeping them very safe and taking them back to France to then try and emulate that music and write it in a classical style to share with the rest of the world. The reason to do this was because a lot of music at that time in Europe was programmatic music, or music that told a story. And Debussy was trying to tell more vivid stories with his music, so he was going out and actually finding the source material. And he was bringing it back and actually getting this accomplished. He has some amazing pieces of music like Le Mer, which translates to the sea, or Nuages, which is clouds. And he's creating these soundscapes and these atmospheres with his music that had not been heard of before. In fact, it was well before jazz was established in America. Jazz happens in the 20s, Debussy dies in 1918. So Debussy is actually starting to mix the African drumming he heard in Africa with the non-traditional scales he heard from the East, and then the little bits of ragtime and blues that were starting to come from the United States. And with all these ingredients, he starts to make like a musical stew that incorporated all of these things, and the French loved it. And this eventually is why the French loved American jazz during World War II in the 1940s. Good examples of this are the rhythmic elements of syncopation from blues and ragtime in uh, his Gollywog's Cakewalk that he actually wrote for his daughter, and extended harmonies, extended chords that he used in his very famous piece, Claire de Lune. And if we combine the elements of these two pieces, it would sound very much like any number of jazz tunes from the 1920s onward. He is sort of the father of jazz in this way, even though jazz was not even a word that was invented by the time Debussy had passed away. But with all this talk about syncopation and extended chords, I guess we have to think about maybe what is an extended chord. So in order to know what an extended chord is, first we must know what a normal chord is. And a normal chord has three notes in it. Therefore, it stands to reason that an extended chord is going to have more than three notes. So what's a basic chord? We'll pick the key of C major. On the piano, no sharps, no flats, so it's just all the white keys. So if we're picking C major, a C major chord would have the first, the third, and the fifth notes of the scale in it. So if you just start counting notes in a C major scale, C is 1, D is 2, E is 3, F is 4, G is 5. So your chord is C, E, and G. To make it extended, we're going to take what we have already, and we're going to build on it. So this classical chord, we started with that single note, C, and we built a third above it. So counting up C, E, uh, C, D, E, there's three notes. And then we built another third above that. So E, F, G, there's your three notes. So it's three notes, two sets of thirds. So for the extended chord, we're going to add another third above the top note. So starting on that G now, we're going to go up three notes. So G is one, A is two, and B is three. So now this C chord is now a C, E, G, B chord, 
And if you start counting notes, going from C up to B, that's seven. C, D, E, F, G, A, B. So now this, because we added a seventh on top of the root note, is going to be called a seventh chord. Not very inventive, and we don't want it to be inventive. We want it to make it easy. So we added a seventh note above the first, and it's just called a seventh. But wait, we can add more. So we can get much bigger than a seventh chord. If we take the seventh chord, and then we add another third on top of the B, B, C, D, we get a chord like this. And we can keep adding notes in intervals of a third above each note. And then we're going to call that chord the name of the top note that was added. So this one, um, we added a ninth above C. So if you just count from C up to the next D, you get nine notes. So this is a ninth chord. And we can build all the way up to 13th chords until we start duplicating notes. Now, I know you see an F sharp in there, but it's sort of like everything else. At some point, we're going to run out of fingers on the piano to play all these notes. And there is a rhyme and a reason to what notes you're going to cut out and why we're going to use that F sharp instead of an F natural. But jazz theory is a whole nother discussion. So just trust me, we're going to go with an F sharp there. But after we start doing that, after we start going up beyond the 13th chord, we start duplicating notes. And then we sort of get into a giant sea of notes, which generally doesn't happen. So jazz. Jazz is a musical language with more options. So jazz has more notes available in a chord than classical music does. So this is where a lot of confusion happens with classical musicians. Classical musicians expect three, maybe four at the very most. With jazz musicians, they're fully expected to find a chord with four or five notes in it and know how it works. So that's the first bit of confusion with classical musicians. And then there's one more important aspect of jazz where anyone who's left from the classical world that still likes jazz, they start to lose their nerve when you talk about improvisation. So show me the notes, please. The basic emphasis of classical music is learning, teaching, and performing all of the notes on the page. Play them all exactly the way that they are written, the way they have been done for hundreds of years. Improvisation is the opposite of this. You're creating something without any sort of preparation. You're completely making it up as you go straight from scratch. So what is musical improvisation? Why are classical mus musicians so terrified of this? They're so used to seeing notes and playing them. So the concept is a little bit daunting. For jazz players, they actively are thinking all of the time. Not to say classical musicians aren't, but they're thinking differently. Jazz musicians are thinking about the key signature of the tune that they are playing and also the chord progression that's being used in the song. And that's the big thing that classical music musicians generally don't do. They're just playing the notes on the page. They're not necessarily thinking about the bigger picture. So what jazz musicians do with the key and also the chord progression is they're going to fiddle around with the notes in these scales to create more music than what's on the page. And they're going to be expressing themselves with unwritten melodies. And they can do this a number of ways. They can just say, okay, we're in the key of C major, so I'm gonna use all the notes in a C major scale, and I can use that for the entire tune. That's totally doable. They could also say, well, I'm in C major, but the chord that we're playing right now as a group is a G major chord. So I'm going to use all the notes in a G major scale instead of the C major scale. Or you could do any number of things. You can start using modes like the Gregorian monks used to do, like Miles Davis did when he was experimenting with modal jazz. And you get lots of possibilities for what to do. But this is not new. So yeah, jazz musicians are improvising and they're making a living out of it starting in the 1940s. But improv has been going on for over 200 years. And that puts us back in the classical time period because soloists in the classical genre were often given opportunities to show off during an instrumental concerto with an orchestra. So in Mozart's violin concerto number no. three, for example, there's a thing called a cadenza. And that's the time for the instrumentalist, for the soloist to show off. And those cadenzas were originally improvised. That's right. There were many fantastic classical virtuosic 
virtuoso performers, virtuosic performers, who would regularly improvise to entertain or just simply flex their musical muscle. And they would take the themes, the melodic themes that the composer had written and start doing their own thing on them. And this was completely normal. It happened in the Baroque time period with George Friedrich Handel and Johann Sebastian Bach. It happened in the classical time period very much with Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Ludwig van Beethoven, Felix Mendelssohn, sort of the crossover between classical and romantic, just like Beethoven was, he did this, especially as a child. And then all of the pianists in the romantic time period of Frederick Chopin, Sergei Rachmaninoff, and Franz Liszt, all were well known for their improvisational skills. Franz Liszt, in fact, a Hungarian-born pianist and composer, would regularly dazzle his audiences, large audiences in concert halls, small audiences in, in house parlors and palaces with his standard com pieces, uh, standardly composed pieces that he would write or others would write, and just flashy improvisatory pieces that he would just make up on the spot, much to the delight of everybody who got to see him play. And Liszt was living before Debussy. Um, you know, he was always experimenting with pushing boundaries, the same sort of stuff that Debussy was doing just before Debussy. Things that Liszt was doing was he was taking whole Beethoven symphonies written for all the instruments, uh, virtuosic violin pieces, show pieces by Niccolo Paganini, and songs, Lieder, by Franz Schubert, and rearranging them all for solo piano. So he'd be playing all these different parts on one instrument at once. And all this work, as he was arranging, led to different sort of influences when he was writing his own music, so that he was adding accidentals, chromatic notes, which led to extended harmonies, which eventually, towards the end of his life, led to music without a tonal center. So you wouldn't really know what key you're in, much like complex bebop was in the 1940s in jazz. And before Liszt passed away, he actually started writing a treatise, sort of like a, an early book called The Harmony of the Future. But it was never published, and his family could never find the notes. We just hear anecdotes from a couple people who, who saw it when they went to go visit him, but no one knows what happened to it. And it would be fascinating to read his thoughts on the matter because the music, especially at the end of Liszt's life, was foreshadowing all the things to come. He started writing different sorts of harmonies. Instead of chords based on thirds, C, E, G, they were harmonies based on fourths. So you would have C going up to an F, going up to a B or a B flat, and that would be quartal harmony. And he uses this in piano pieces like the Mestifo Waltz, uh, his third one, there's a few. Um, he wrote music like Debussy did with extended chords uh, called Nuages Gris, uh, which is French for gray clouds. And Debussy, in fact, has his Nuages orchestral work, and it's based on these concepts of Liszt. And of course, like I said, Liszt was starting to write music with no discernible key signature whatsoever, like his Bagatelle, without tonality. So Liszt, a very fascinating person. He was the first composer to also be a soloist who would perform solo recitals just by himself. He wouldn't jump on to another concert or anything else going on. It would be, hey, come see Liszt and Liszt only. And when he did this, of course, he performed his own music, but he also performed works of J.S. Bach, Franz Schubert, Ludwig von Beethoven. And on top of it, he would search out new younger composers and sort of take them under their wing, people like Claude Debussy. And Franz Liszt, he performed up until his dying days. He was giving master classes on the piano all throughout Europe, and he was still performing concerts, still actually having a piano festival right before he passed away. Um, and he's always been remembered for his amazing piano work, his technique, and his wild innovations to his music and his piano improvisations. But he wasn't the first to do it, although he was really good. There's always J.S. Bach. J.S. Bach, about 150 years before that, all the way, we've skipped the classical time period. There are plenty of great Im improvisational players like Mozart and Beethoven in the classical time period. But we're going to go straight to the master. The master composer of the Baroque era was Bach. And while Mendelssohn and Beethoven and Mozart all used improvisation to great effect, Bach was the pinnacle of improvisational performance. And that's because a lot of music in the churches where Bach worked had to be improvised on the spot. He was writing some music for hymns, uh, which are uh, sort of songs for the church. but. If he was not writing them, he might only have a bass line or might only have a melody of somebody else's hymn. So on the organ, he would have to 
flesh out the rest of those notes and just make it up on the spot. So he wasn't playing piano as he was doing this, as he was practicing all of his improvisation. He was on the organ. And so he was writing all of these hymns um, and other things for church services. So regular services like those hymns, Christmas services, Easter services, the Eucharist. Ooh, there's that word again. So just like Geraldi did much later, Bach was doing the same thing. And with a lot of this music, it's four-part harmony. So what that means is that there's a melody and then three other things happening. So we have a soprano, alto, tenor, and bass line for these hymns. So Bach was learning how to take a melody and then write other things as well that were also somewhat melodic to make the other singers not bored. But he was not doing just choir music. He was doing classical music as well. So the stuff not for the church was for solo violin, so violin just by themselves, cello just by itself, small orchestras, larger orchestras, uh, the lute, the harpsichord, the organ, choirs, and other ensembles that he could find and put together. And okay, Bach didn't actually invent anything, but everything that he did was done at the highest level at the time. And in fact, when Bach passed away in 1750, it changed the way music was written. That was the end of the Baroque period because the master had passed. So Bach helped to standardize orchestral writing for the traditional symphonic orchestra that we get in the classical time period. Uh, he wrote six Brandenburg concertos, Italian would be concerti, uh, really famous things with large orchestras that weren't really done much at the time. He used all of the known techniques at the time to compose intricate works for the violin and cello just by themselves, which are completely amazing, immaculate pieces of music. And he also wrote similar things for what we now would consider a piano. He wrote preludes and fugues in every key, every major key, every minor key, all 24 of them. And a well-tempered clavier would be an instrument that was tuned very much like the way we tune things now. So at the time, things weren't tuned like they are now. So Bach was ahead of his time here trying to write something for these types of instruments. So why does that make it special? Why did we start with jazz and now suddenly we're talking about somebody who was alive in 1720? Well, these unaccompanied works by Bach were a little bit uncanny. Bach was able to write really long and elaborate and really beautiful melodies. It wasn't just fluff. And he was able to incorporate bass lines with them that would weave through many keys with the melody. So he didn't just stay in one place and go over and over. He did a lot of interesting stuff with this harmony. And he was able to combine the two, the melody and the bass line, to be able to play it on a single instrument. Now, for a keyboard instrument like an organ or a harpsichord or a clavier, this is not a problem. You have two hands, it's fine. But for the violin or for the cello, this is wildly innovative. Normally, we picture a violin or a cello to play just one line of music at once, and Bach is writing two lines or three lines, and yes, even four. And these instruments only have four strings, so Bach is utilizing the entire instrument to play four melodies at once by one player. And then on top of that, he would add an extra layer, or maybe two or three, because that's the genius he was, to the melody and the bass line. And while it's not outrageous, although it is difficult for a keyboard player, it's extremely difficult to execute these things musically on any other instrument. And one of the ways he did this was by writing fugues, or writing something that sort of was an echo of itself. So what is a fugue? Well, I sort of just said, it's like an elaborate canon or sort of an elaborate round. So we have to discuss these two things. A round is a short, simple melody that can be sung as harmony to itself just by singing the exact same thing, but at a different time. So most people know row, row, row your bro boat or Frere Jaca. Um, it's the same melody. It's a short little melody. Somebody starts it, somebody else comes in a measure or two later, you're not adding anything else. There's no bass line, there's no harmony. The harmony is just the melody being played at a different time. Now, if you take that and you add a bass line, or maybe even harmony on top of it, that's called a canon. So the melody is going to be a little bit longer, it's going to be a little bit more complex, but we're adding a bass line and therefore we might add a harmony to it as well, but you're just going to repeat that bass line and that harmony over and over and over again while the melody just continues over and over again. Um, a great example of this is the very famous Canon in D by Johann Pachelbel, uh, used at weddings, it's sort of like known as the wedding song. And while overplayed, it is a magnificent piece of music and a wonderfully written canon. 
but it's all in D. It doesn't change key. The cello part is the same eight notes like 64 times in a row. While interesting, not terribly interesting, but that's where fugues come in. A fugue is a canon where the harmony changes. Therefore, the keys change. And the melodies, they might be really, really similar, but they're actually going to start on different notes. And because of that, that's going to make all the harmonies and all the performance very different. People are going to have to modulate as the harmony around them changes. And because the harmony is changing, you have to start the melody on a different key. And you might have to change one or two interview intervals in the melody as you're going on. So fugues are pretty interesting pieces of music. And they're not always written because they're very difficult. They can get really complex. And Bach would use all of his creative prowess to make really complicated fugues. He could write a fugue with two distinct melodies, not just one melody, two melodies, and have them each played separately. So maybe the right hand of the piano would play the melody, and then after that, the left hand would start, and the right hand would start doing something else, another melody, and then the left hand would sort of follow, sort of you know, follow the leader type thing. There are also kinds of fugues where you could have those two or even more of those melodies, but instead of going follow the leader, they might actually start crossing paths. So this happens a lot. Um, and it's not just Bach that did this. Other composers did it as well. Uh, Handel did it in the overture to his Messiah. Uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart did it in the Kyrie eleison of his Requiem Mass. So not out of the ordinary to hear a fugue like this, which is called a double fugue. But the melody can actually get even more complicated than just starting at the beginning and going. So fugues are really complex. Bach, for example, he might take the subject or the melody and just repeat it, just like we talked about. He'll have the right hand play it and then he'll have the left hand play it. Or you could take that melody and instead of starting at the first note, going to the last note, rewrite it so that the last note comes first and you can play it backwards. And Bach would do this. He would have the right hand start with the melody. And then when the left hand came in, it would actually be playing the melody, but backwards in retrograde. So if we can go forwards and backwards, can you turn it upside down? Of course you can. So this would be an inverted melody. So if you sort of picture your melody and if it looks like a mountain, you can now rewrite it with the same intervals to make it a valley. So we've got, we've got melodies going forwards, we have melodies going backwards, we have melodies going upside down. And because you're Bach and you're just a little bit extra, you can make it go backwards and upside down. And this would be called a quadruple fugue with inverted retrograde. Yeah, pretty impressive. So all the notes that were happening at that time would often create chords with at least four notes. So this is starting to sound a little bit like what we were talking about earlier. Some of those notes would be in the original key, but some of them would be in a different key, but at least close to related, sort of like that F sharp was closely related to that C way back when we made that giant chord in the, in the jazz chords. And because of this, because what Bach was doing by adding all of these notes, the forwards, the backwards, the upside down, and the upside down and backwards melodies, these harmonies were really, really futuristic for the time period. This was simply not done by anybody else but Bach. And in fact, that concept of having two or more, especially two, more than two melodies happening at the same time, that was one of the aspects that later generations, like people in the classical time period, they said, all right, that's enough. It's a little bit too, expen uh, too excessive. That's, that's a little bit too Baroque for me. And Baroque literally means irregularly shaped. And usually they were talking about pearls, but they started talking about music the same way because of all the ornamentation and all of the extra stuff that Bach was adding. So at the highest level of complexity that Bach, Bach would write with these fugues and get this, he would improv these fugues. He would just do it on the spot. Amazing. They would include four melodies happening at once, some forward, some backwards, sometimes upside down, and sometimes backwards and upside down. And all of the chords that were created by this quasi chaotic arrangement of melodies going every which way created really advanced harmony for the time. And back then they didn't really know what to call it, but now 
we would just call them extended chords. And this level of complexity would not be reached until after Mozart and Beethoven were making strides with symphonies and string quartets, and until after Liszt and Chopin and Rachmaninoff and Debussy were completing their experiments with the new soundscapes in the Romantic in the early 20th century, and not until after American composers were combining Bach with ragtime and African drummings with the slave work songs and the New Orleans-style bands, and until brave virtuosos began to take melodies into their own hands to express the inexpressible through a collection of notes that describe through the dissonance and the consonance and the resolution of all these notes, the struggle of their lives. Also, you can have jazz today. So it's a bit weird to think of classical musicians who don't like jazz because all of the jazz really comes from Debussy, which came from Liszt, which came from the traditions that came way before Liszt, all the way back to Bach, to the improvisational qualities of writing fugues forwards and backwards with extended harmonies and these big chords and these notes that even though they didn't fit a chord, they were all going somewhere and they all had a purpose, just like jazz. So jazz is way more than holiday music. It's the culmination of everything in classical music. It's sort of the practical application of all the theory, and then they build on it. It's the start of what's on the radio now, because we can't really imagine R&B or rap or hip hop or rock and roll without the blues and the jazz influence that it comes from. So really, jazz is the classical music of the pop. So I encourage everybody out there go listen. And there's a lot of interesting stuff out there. We have Stefan Grappelli, who is a jazz violinist back during World War II. He worked with that guy, uh, Django Reinhardt. He was a guitarist with only three fingers on his left hand. So a gypsy guitarist, fascinating, Amer uh, amazing music from France. They loved the American style and, and Grappelli jumped right in with it. Uh, now you can go see Regina Carter, an amazing jazz violinist combining African rhythms, combining pop music, combining metal, combining all sorts of things, all under the guise of jazz. And of course, jazz would be absolutely nothing without the bass. And Charles Mingus was an experimental jazz bassist who was writing melodies and performing extended solos. All kinds of amazing things. Uh, we talked about John Coltrane, there's Miles Davis, there's Herbie Hancock. He's still around today. He's got some famous stuff. Stevie Wonder uh, works a lot with jazz. Um, we think of the great crooners of the 1940s, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin. We have Harry Connick Jr. He has a talk show now, but he was first a crooner, just like Michael Buble is. And there's all kinds of things out there, every kind of style for jazz for everybody. So go take a listen and go take a, a read as well. Um, here are the sources, and there's plenty of other stuff out there. All it takes is a, a quick search on your favorite web browser to find a lot of amazing information about jazz, and especially the crossover from the French music of Ravel and Debussy into the way that they used quartal harmony and the way that they used chords and the way that someone like Bill Evans started using all these same chords in his jazz, which comes straight out of the classical music, just the practical application. So... Go out there, you cool cats, and enjoy yourself some jazz. Happy listening.